So it will continue our discussion of Srimad Bhagavad Gita and we have been discussing chapter number 2 and on the last sections so some 10 verses are remaining I will try to cover today Let's chant the prayers Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Vicharini Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashyata Desatarini Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vashadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, uh, we have been continuing on uh, chapter number chapter number two, where uh, we have been discussing about the last section of Bhagavad Gita in chapter number two, where Arjuna asked a question. Arjuna asked a question. He's saying, you know, uh, about uh, the symptoms of realized soul. Right, and then uh, Krishna started explaining him about this position. So that's how it started. It starts from chapter uh, sloks 54 and continues till 72. Krishna answers all the questions. So the four questions being asked by Arjuna. Let's revise it again very quickly. And then we'll go from there. So in the 54th verse, Arjuna asks four questions. He says, Arjuna Vacha, uh, what four questions were Sita uh, Pragyasa Ka Bhasa? So, what is his uh, symptoms? So, Bhasa is symptoms, so language or symptoms basically, uh, what is quality? What is general symptom? And then Samadhi uh, Stasya Keshava. So, how? And then he says, Stita Dhira Kim Prabhasheta. Kim Ashita Brajita Kim. Kim Pravasheta means uh, how does he speak? Pravasheva is he speak, but uh, understanding is it not that how he speaks, his, or what language he speaks, it's basically how he he responds to uh, responds to receiving any you know, blame or you know, happiness or you know, praise or honor, dishonor things. And then the fourth one it says Kim Ashita. Kim Ashita means how does he sit? Ashita means sit. But in the context is that how does he restrain from his sense, from the sense objects? So how he controls his senses? So and uh, we have uh, Krishna gives an example of tortoise. How tortoise controls senses whenever we see dangers, he puts everything under his cell. So in a similar way, this dhira purusha they also control their senses. And the fourth one. That is Kim, uh, Brajeta Kim. So Brajeta Kim is basically how does he walk? So it's not about how does he walk and how he puts his steps. It's basically how does he respond to sense objects? So the four section we have not completed yet. We'll cover this today. So when asking to Kavasa, Krishna says he, he is the Dhira Purusha, is uh, completely uh, situated in self, self realization. He is equipoised. He doesn't. And again, in, in answering uh, Kim Pravasheta, he says, you know, he is completely equipoised to uh, honor, dishonor, and everything. And then Kim Ashita, he, he controls his senses properly. And basically, he uh, we also discussed that he actually engages senses in Krishna consciousness. So we'll continue from there. Uh, we have continued till 60 verses, uh, 61. And we'll continue there. So in 60 verse, we have discussed about Prabhupada mentions how, uh, sorry, in 61 verse, Prabhupada mentions about how, uh, giving an example of Amrish Maharaj, like how he engages all his senses in the service of Lord. So Amrish Maharaj used to engage all of his senses, like, you know, by uh, from eyes, he could see Krishna's lotus feet, uh, from ears, he could hear about Lord Krishna, and from mind, he used to think about Lord Krishna. By his hands, he would uh, you know, clean the temples. From By his foot, he used to walk to pilgrimage. Uh, and from his nostril, he used to smell 
uh, tulsi leaf and flowers offered to Lord Krishna, and from his tongue he could eat Krishna prasadam. So in this way, he engages all his body, his limbs in the service of Lord Sri Krishna. And that's how Prabhupada says that we should also try to learn and engage our senses in that. Right. So continuing from there, uh, the 62 verse. So in this 62 verse, it's been described that uh, what happens for uh, when, you know, uh, how does this, this sense, you know, if we do not control our senses or we do not control our mind or who says uncontrolled mind, what happens to them? Like, uh, just one second. Yeah, so what happens to that? Krishna explains there were stages of downfall of uncontrolled mind. So mind should be controlled, isn't it? And uh, if you see, you have discussed earlier as well, the analogy of a horse. So uh, in, the, in a horse analogy, what happens? How many people are there? One is the horse, the five horses. They are compared to our five senses and the reins, right? Uh, all the horses are being tied by the reins. So we know that the horses are controlled by the reins. Isn't it? If you pull them left, horse will move left. If you pull right, horse will move right. And then that is basically the driver control the reins of horses. So horses are the senses and the reins, uh, horses are sense of senses and the reins, they are actually mind and uh, the driver is intelligence and then come the passenger. Passenger is actually the soul. So if uh, I could have got the picture, but somehow it came to my, my mind right now. Uh, what happened? Let's just imagine if the five horses, if someone is driving in a chariot and that chariot got five horses and the driver is unable to control the horses. So do we think that the passenger will reach his destination? It's not possible, isn't it? Because five horses will go in five directions here and there. It's very, very difficult to control. So that's how the driver, basically in our context, the driver is intelligence. So when the driver can control the reins, and the reins is basically the mind, and through the reins, he controls the senses. So the intelligence controls the mind, and mind controls the senses and senses control the sense object anyway. So then the passenger can actually reach his destination. So Krishna ex he, he explains how, how does the opposite happens. So what happens when the mind is uncontrolled or the passenger or the driver is not able to control uh, the horses through his reins. So what happens? So that comes two verses in Krishna explains in two verses, 62 and 63. This is a very, very important verse as well for us to understand why we should uh, try to regulate our mind, why we should try to control our minds and not let it go as they are. So the verse is Dhyayate Vishyan Pumsa Sangaste Supajayate Sangat Sanjayate Kama Kamat Krodha Vijayate. And I'll read the third, second, uh, 63 as well, and I'll continue discussion. And it says, Krodhat Bhavati Samoha, Samoha Smriti Bibramaha, Smriti Brahmashad Buddhi Naso, Buddhi Nashad Pranashati. So these are the six stages, seven stages, or when say it's you know, kind of nearly eight ages stages where the uh, action of minds works. So first it says what? Dhyayate Vishyan Ponsaha. So that is, uh, translation says that. Uh, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And from the such attachment, lust develops and from lust arises anger. So four things being described in this verse and the four things described in the next verse. Verse is dhyate visvam pumsams. When, when the sense objects, they contemplate on some things, then what happens? Sangha stesu pajayate. Then, a person develops attachment towards these objects. So senses basically, so our senses, eyes, ear, you know, nose, tongue, skin. So by eyes, we see the sense object of basically see. And the, from ear, we hear. And from, you know, from mouth or from tongue, we taste. And nose from we smell. And from skin, touch. So these are the sense objects. And when sense objects, 
the contempt when senses contemplate on sense objects what happens a person develops attachment just for example uh, when we go to go to shopping mall when we are walking like you know we say sometime you know window shopping so what we do in window shopping normally we actually see this okay this shirt looks very good and then we start thinking of that sir so, okay if i go to that party or there then i will look like this or this will look good, good to me and then we start contemplating on the object that's being seen by our eyes right and then we start an attachment towards the shirt okay that t-shirt or shirt looks very good and then person says okay let me buy it out right so that's how attachment happens so again this is talking in a higher sense but i'm just giving trying to give an example of how it happens so when the sense object senses start contemplating on the sense object a person develops attachment sangas te su pajayate so what happens attachment happens and then when when we have that attachment for the object now what we want to get it so the i i saw a shirt and that looks very nice and now i want to buy it however i am incapable of buying it just for us for the sake of example like i am incapable of buying it so then what happened lust develops basically uh, it's called as you know sangat uh, sanjata kama so it kama doubled i i want to buy it then what happened if i unable to buy it kamat kurodha vijayate because the lust develop i wanted to have the shirt now i am not able to get it so what happens anger arises and so these are the four stages first is what contemplation of the objects then through contemplation attachment happens from attachment lust arises and from lust anger arises and the next verse uh 63rd says it's all interlinked krodhat krodhat bhavati samoha when from the krodha it becomes delusion samoha it become delusion and samoha smriti bimrama and then up when it become delusion then the bewilderment of mind happens so person cannot think well because of attachment and then loss of intelligence so buddhi nasho so from that buddhi becomes uh, you know uh, it it lost it get lost it can't think what to do right and then the fall down happens so let's see what what purpose writes in his purport uh, he gives an example like that uh, one who is not in krishna conscious is subjected to material desires while contemplating the, the objects of the senses the senses requires real engagement and if they are not engaged in transcendental loving service of the lord they will certainly seek engagement in the service of materialism so earlier also we have discussed many times that we are servant either we serve to krishna or we serve to maya devi or our senses sense on enjoyment so if the senses are not engaged in a proper way then it will definitely seek engagement in something materialism that for sure because sense it cannot be remain calm and we also discussed like you know uh, a person having no desire it's kind of a dead dead body isn't it so a person has a desire and thinks so in the similar purpa also gives an example here uh, saying that uh, the secret of the success is to control the mind and uh, one who is not there therefore in krishna consciousness however powerful he may be in controlling the senses by artificial repression is surely ultimately to fail so here again also gives a uh, example of you know hardash thakur as we discussed earlier that hardash thakur you know uh, it was actually a, uh, a prostitute came to lure him but uh, she could not do it at, at the end Yes, she became a servant of hardash thakur she became disciple of sadha hardash thakur right so that's how the controlling of senses of basically the contemplation starts from that or controlling the uh, senses through the mind is required and the mind being should be controlled by intelligence so till now what happened something we we, we have desire we start thinking of that it becomes when we think more and more and more attachment comes 
and fourth we need to get that thing it's basically we start working hard for that there's basically lust arises for that and then when we fail to get it anger arises and as soon as anger is there the mind becomes uncontrolled we cannot think what to do what is right and what is wrong that's why it's many a time it's being said right, when you want to take a good decision be calm be composed think properly why because we we are going to take a great decision now good decision now for something else right so our mind should be in control otherwise we will be taking a bad decision and hence so in this category when so krishna explaining about the one who is, has uncontrolled mind so the sixth stage is sammoha smriti bibramaha so the bewilderment of memory happens and after that the buddhi nasha or loss of intelligence and once intelligence is lost the person gets fall down right and and uh, then that's basically fall down means again he accept this materialistic things as everything and he works for it and at the at the end uh, he is again in this cycle propad gives an uh, example here about give, giving example of uh, falgo bairagya or uh, uh the stage of renunciation uh where they have not properly uh, understood the what the real essence is right so what is say there's basically falgo or less intelligent and the tropad gives an example like less for an impersonalist so impersonalist thinks that uh supreme one is impersonal he is not a person so in that in that context they cannot eat uh because uh, he is impersonal and uh, he can't eat he is not a person but at the same time so they cannot enjoy eating as well at the same time uh, the devotee they knew very well very well that lord or supreme lord is a person so as he is a supreme person then the devotee they actually make so many palatable dishes and offer to krishna and then they enjoy it get they get the bliss of lord krishna as prasad as a remnant right and that's how it's called prasad and then rupa says thus everything become spiritualized because it's being offered to krishna right and therefore there is no danger of downfall so when we engage our senses in krishna consciousness there is no uh, danger of downfall or on the, on the other hand if you do not engage our senses in krishna consciousness uh, there is chances of fall down and it it happens because you know we engage in materialistic life right so and uh, propal mentioned in last that the the impersonalist therefore cannot enjoy life due to his artificial renunciation and they they are just just try to uh, renounce everything thinking that okay this is these are calling our gyanis you no know, they try to renounce everything without understanding the understanding the higher knowledge and hence for that reason a slight agitation of mind pulls him down again into the pool of material existence and it is said that such a soul even though rising up to the point of liberation falls down again due to he is not having support in devotional service that's why devotional service basically engaging our senses into the service of lord is required right so till now uh till now krishna answers the third questions of arjuna ki mashita and then now he uh answers the fourth question scheme prajeta how does he walk right and then krishna continues saying here that raga devesha vimuktastu vishayan indriya charan atma vishir vidhyat atma prasadam adigachati but nicely krishna explains about what is prasad prasad is basically mercy of lord and he says so krishna now in two verses explain about the uncontrolled mind what happens for uncontrolled mind and now he is saying but a person free from all attachment and aversion and able to control his senses so now anyone who can control his senses through regulative principles of freedom so see regulative principles of freedom that's a very good word isn't it so regulative principles basically 
to follow the principles for devotional service that is basically it makes us freedom it's actually making us free from this bondage of uh, birth and death cycle isn't it that's how it's uh, regulative principles for freedom it's not binding us it's actually making us free some sometimes people think that okay this uh hari krishna movement people they don't eat uh, no uh, not offered food they don't eat meat and they do, don't don't eat egg and uh, don't don't drink tea and then blah 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 but actually they say they are actually restricting themselves but the thing is uh when we engage ourselves with krishna consciousness with regulatory principle we are actually making ourselves free not binding ourselves right and and what happens in this verse krishna says prasadam adigachati and then they obtain the complete mercy of the lord so by controlling the mind by controlling the sense senses by controlling the contemplation of the sense objects what happens and through relative principles so how how you can control the mind and how can you control your senses when you engage your senses in something higher right so that's how by engaging our senses in that way what we obtain we obtain the mercy of the lord attaining the prasad and the prophet says it is already explained that one may externally control the senses by some artificial process but unless the senses are engaged in the transcendental service of the lord there is every chance of a fail of, of a fall so the senses okay like you know okay someone may be say okay i am controlling my senses because i don't want to eat sweet because i'm diabetic but still, still the desire is there to eat it uh, sweet by when and whenever he gets ch- chances he actually take some sweets as well so the desire is still there but when the desire is converted toward serving the lord then it's not more no more artificial right and then that's a proper continue saying that although the person in full knowledge full uh, although the person in full krishna consciousness may apparently be on the sensual plane because of his being krishna consciousness he has no attachment for sensual activities and hence the krishna conscious person is concerned only with the satisfaction of krishna and nothing else so the devotee they always actually please krishna they work for pleasing krishna and hence uh, they are free from attachment they are free from aversion and hence uh, they are getting the mercy of the lord and uh, propas says that uh, uh, if krishna wants the devotee can do anything which is ordinary undesirable on, on the other hand if krishna does not want a devotee shall not do that which he would have ordinarily done for his own satisfaction so basically uh, the devotees they are krishna centric they they try to do activities which is going to please krishna hey right. so this uh, propas say this consciousness of of working or you know uh, doing any service with krishna centric like trying to please krishna and this consciousness is the causeless mercy of the lord which the devotee can achieve in in spite of being attached to the sensual platform and right. so though it looks to be there but actually they are getting mercy of lord and they are all working for the pleasure of lord hari right so that's how 65 says that when we have our mind controlled we actually get the mercy of lord so you know uh, in a, in one of the lecture i was hearing it says the mind actually does nothing mind has just only two things to do what it is he accepts or rejects he says yes or no the ultimate thing is the intelligence so that's we can come say sometimes buddhi as mind or intelligence but the on the if you if you distinguish between intelligence and mind intelligence is the one actually he works he thinks shall i do it or not and he he start thinking he he gives reasoning why to do why not to do but the mind only say okay yes and no accept and reject accept and reject nothing else and right. so in so intelligence when intelligence is controlled or the buddhi is being controlled then 
he can think properly and he can take a good decision and then mind will accept it. So through mind, he control the senses and when the senses are controlled, the senses cannot go towards sense object or even they, they see it, but they won't contemplate it. It's like uh, Krishna gives an example earlier, like tortoise. So tortoise, whenever they see danger, they actually pull back their senses. So that's how uh, the devotee or who is in on an elevated position, they actually they control their senses in that in that way. Right. And then now Krishna says, what happens? Uh, next, uh, what happens if uh, when we get mercy? So what happens when we get mercy? He says, for one, the satisfied in Krishna consciousness, the threefold miseries of the material existence exist no longer. And in such satisfied consciousness, one's intelligence is soon well established. Right. So that is basically uh, kind of the result of prasad. So when we get the mercy of Lord, when we have, we have to try to, so when we try to control our mind, when we try to control our senses and engage the senses in Krishna consciousness, engage the senses in the service of the Lord, we get the mercy. And when we get the mercy, the person becomes completely satisfied. In, in the process of devotional service, in the process of Krishna consciousness. And hence, this threefold misery, these threefold miseries are Adhidevik, Adhibhotik and Adhyatmik that we get by our body, by our you know, uh, surroundings and by the nature. So these miseries no longer exist for the person who is well established in self-realization. And hence, his intelligence is soon well established. So the intelligence being become properly established in, in the higher stage. Right. And then in 66th verse, Krishna explains what happens if we do not connect ourselves with Krishna. So in previous two verses, Krishna explains about when we try to uh, control the senses, uh, control the mind, we get the mercy, and we get the mercy, we attain, uh, we, we attain prasada, and uh, then uh, even by getting the mercy, our intelligence is well established. And now Krishna is explaining the other way around, what happens if we do not connect ourselves with Krishna. He says, nasti buddhir ayuktasya na chayuktasya bhavana na chabha vayaktaha shantir Asantasya kuta shukam. Asantasya kuta shukam. So when one who is not connected with the Supreme or in devotional service, Papa says in Krishna consciousness, he can never, he can neither, he can neither have transcendental intelligence nor can have a steady mind. So without engaging our senses in Krishna consciousness, we won't be having the proper intelligence or transcendental intelligence. Intelligence, you know, intelligence, we may say, okay, someone is very, very, uh, you know, uh, ha have gone through so many degrees, have studied well, he has got PhD and others. That's not intelligence. He is talking about transcendental intelligence, the one who understand about the difference between the body and the soul, one who knows very well what is body and what is soul, one who knows well that how soul is connected to super soul. And he, one he knows that what the relationship between the soul and the super soul, that is called as transcendental intelligence. So without connecting with the Supreme, anyone or any person cannot have two things, neither transcendental intelligence nor steady mind. So both is not possible for them. And without that, if our mind is not steady, if, if we don't have the proper intelligence and without that, there is no point of peace. So without which there is no possibility of peace. And if there is no peace, how can anyone be happy? Or how can anyone be blissful? Blissful is again a higher thing. So without controlled mind, without the knowledge of uh, 
transcendental intelligence without the connection with the supreme there is there is no proper intelligence there is no study of mind and without that there is no peace and if there is no peace in mind there is no question of being blissful or no question of being happy right and the purpose right and the purport that unless one is in krishna consciousness there is no possibility of peace so it is confirmed in the fifth chapter 5.29 when uh, that when one understand that krishna is the only enjoyer of the good results of sacrifice and penances that he is a proprietor of all universal manifestation and that he is the real friend of all living entities then only one can have real peace so 529 is basically called as peace formula we will discuss it krishna prabhu says that this is a peace formula to know uh, how can we become peace so prabhu in this purport says you know people do not know how to be peace but everyone is looking for peace everyone is looking for happiness but no one knows it and bhagavad gita gives the answer in 529 and therefore if one is not in krishna consciousness there cannot be a final goal of the mind and disturbance is due to want of ultimate goal and when one is certain that krishna is the enjoyer so disturbance is due to the want of the ultimate goal and when one is certain that krishna is the enjoyer proprietor and friend of everyone and everything then one can with steady mind brings about peace so without engaging in relations to krishna without engaging ourselves in krishna service uh, it's always in distress and no peace hey that's that's verse 66 and uh, krishna continues in 67 as well <clears throat> what he says that uh, he, he gives an example that uh, this is the sense objects and uh, contemplation of the sense of are very very strong he says that uh, as a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water and even one of the roaming senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence so that's a, a krishna explains earlier that uh, mind should be controlled right and uh, a mind should control the sense senses so we have five senses and uh, even we go more so even if this any one of the senses we remain uncontrolled that will actually take away man's intelligence how he gives like you know, a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water so that's how I, all the senses should be engaged in krishna consciousness that was propas earlier gave example of amrish maharaj like engage your leg engage your hand engage your you know eyes your ears your nostrils your tongue your you know all the limbs of the body should be engaged in krishna consciousness and uh, i'm i'm forgetting one of the verse and where it says that uh, if we give a small chance to the maya it will grab us from that from the clutches of that so, so do not give any chances to maya maya is very very strong so this verse also conclude uh, confirms that even one of the roaming senses means one of the uncontrolled senses and one one which the mind focuses so when senses becomes uncontrolled the mind focuses on that at the same time mind's intelligence is gone and ha prapa says unless all of the senses are engaged in the service of the lord even one of them engaged in sense gratification can deviate the devotee from the path of transcendental advancement so we have to engage all our senses and uh, prapa says the first thing to start with our tongue so tongue means what tongue can do two things tongue can chant the holy name hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare at the same time tongue can engage can be engaged in testing krishna prasadam so when we engage our tongue while chanting the holy name and uh, eating the krishna prasadam slowly slowly gradually we can see all our senses get engaged in devotional service too so 
that's that's how mercy of Krishna comes. And when we chant the holy name, we because when we chant the holy name, we actually hear the holy name as well. So chanting and hearing both happens at the same time. And when we take Krishna Prasadam, Krishna's mercy is coming to us. Right. And that's how it is 67. Uh, let's see 68. And now Krishna is basically concluding the, his answers to Arjuna. He says, Tasma Dyasya Mahabaho Nigrihitani Sarvasha Indriyani Indriyatabhyas Tasya Pragyana Pratishthana. So he's saying that, therefore, O mighty armed Arjuna, one whose senses are restrained from this, their objects is certainly of a steady intelligence. So, I mean, the same point Krishna is making again, that senses are controlled by the mind and that's again controlled by intelligence. So that person is in a steady intelligence. That is called a stita pragya. So that liberated soul, that elevated soul is well situated in that condition. Right. And hence, uh, in 69 verse, again, he says about uh, a nice analogy, a metaphor of day and night. He says that what is night for all being is the time of awakening for a self-control and the time of awakening for all being is night for the introspective sage. So, it's a kind of a analogy of day and night very nicely. It says that uh, uh, I read the purport actually. So there are two things is being compared. One is uh, uh, what do you say? Sense gratification and uh, service to the Lord. Right. So Prabhupada says there are two classes of intelligent men. One is intelligent in mental activities for sense gratification, and another is introspective and awake to the cultivation of self realization. So, two things one is sense gratification, one is self realization. So, activities of the introspective sage or thoughtful man are night for the person mentally absorbed because this person is actually thinking about something higher. And the other person who is materialistic, it looks to be for him is night because he doesn't know anything what he is doing. So it's not night and day, it's basically ignorance, right? So a uh, sage who is actually walking towards self-realizations, he does so many things, but for, on the other hand, one who is materialistic, who is engaged in sense gratification, he seems like, okay, he is not doing anything, right? And then the, it, it's a bit confusing verse as well because it's a metaphor of day and night. And at the same time, the materialistic person remain asleep in such a night due to their ignorance of self-realization. So I think we got the point now. So it's a night for materialistics. And at the same time, it's a, it's a good time for a self-realized soul who actually absorbed himself in understanding about Lord, about himself, about who soul is. And this other person who is engaged in self in sense gratification doesn't know what he is doing. Right. And the other way, right, uh, other way around should be explained. The introspective sages, they remain alert in the night of the materialistic man. What does that mean? Because for him, the who is a, a liberated soul, or introspective says who is uh, cultivate, trying to cultivate self-realization, he understands that the materialistic person who is engaged in sense gratification, that is actually a night for him because he don't he want to ignore those things. He don't want to see those things, right? And hence the says he feels transcendental pleasure in the gradual advancement of spiritual culture. Whereas a man in materialistic activities being asleep I sleep to self-realization because in night we sleep. So the materialistic person, he, they are sleeping in the cultivation of self-realization. They just don't want to awake themselves for self-realization. And hence, 
being asleep of uh, to self realization they dream for varieties of sense pleasure or feeling something sometimes happy and sometimes distress in his sleeping condition so the introspective man is always indifferent to materialistic happiness and distress so there's a metaphor of a day and night how it happens like uh as i said for a materialistic person sense enjoyment is like like you know okay uh, it's good but for uh, a person who is cultivating self realization he knows that very well that that is night uh, it's ignorance right and that's why he remains away from that and he he, he himself is uh, kind of you know uh, more happier and he is not disturbed by uh, happiness and goodness of happiness or sorrow of materialistic thing right and uh, in the 70th verse uh, krishna says that a person who is not disturbed by the instant flow of desire that enter like a river into the ocean which is ever being filled but is always still and can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desire so the desires are you know, it, there are so many desires comes to us and uh, again analogy is given how it happens it like it's like an ocean so when the river goes into ocean actually they merge the ocean but still we could see that ocean is still calm isn't it and even the 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 level doesn't go away from uh, from a uh, from a point right in the similar way there are so many uh, desires comes up but a person who is self realized he is not disturbed by it like a ocean is not disturbed when so many rivers come and meet him normally if you see this in rainy season rivers are coming in there but it's uh, remain there only right and uh, in the similar way and he achieves peace and um, but there is no peace for the man who strives to satisfy such desire so desires are coming coming and coming and the realized soul he understand that this desire actually is temporary and he just try to ignore those or i to keep that which is who should not be disturbed he is not just being disturbed by these many desires all right and i'll read this uh, passage actually to make it more clear at what rupa says that although the vast ocean is always filled with water it is always especially during the rainy season being filled with much more water but the ocean remain the same the steady it is not agitated nor does it cross beyond the limit of its brink that is also true for a person fixed in krishna consciousness as long as one has the material body the demands of the body for sense gratification will continue isn't it we discussed earlier that the person cannot live without desires the desires will there so demands of the body for sense gratification will continue however the devotee is not disturbed by such desires because of his fullness because he has got the real essence he is always completely uh, in bliss mode by serving krishna so krishna conscious man is not in need of anything because the lord fulfills all of his material necessities therefore he is like the ocean always full in himself desires may come to him like the waters of rivers that flow into the ocean but he is steady in his activities and he is not even slightly disturbed by desires of sense gratification and that is the proof of krishna conscious man and one who has lost all inclination for material sense gratification although the desires are present because he remains satisfied in the transcendental loving service of the lord and he can remain steady like a ocean and therefore enjoys full peace otherwise or others in in another way uh, however who want to fulfill the desire even up to the limit of liberation and what to speak of material success 
never attain peace. So material success that not going to give us peace and uh, the fruit workers, the Salvanist and the yogis who are after mystic powers are all unhappy because of unfulfilled desires. But the person in Krishna consciousness is happy in the service of the Lord. And there is a verse actually in Chaitanya Chaitanya explaining this one uh, that says, uh, that one says, the verse was very nicely is being said in uh, Madhulila uh, that Krishna Bhakta Niskam Ateva Shant Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakaleva Shant. So Krishna Bhakta is Santa. Santa means he is peaceful, he is blissful, he is peaceful. Why? Because he is Nishkama. He has, he has no desire for his own sense gratification. He does work for a satisfaction of the Lord. That's why Krishna Bhakta is Nishkama. And on the other hand, it's being said, Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakale Ashant. So Bhukti, the one who is trying to uh, go for sense enjoyment, right? And uh, even, even the Mukti, the people who are seeking for liberation. So what happens? These Karmis or the fruit workers, they are actually, they, they desire for metal enjoyment. And the Gyanis, they desire for liberation. And the Yogis, they desire for Siddhis. So Siddhi means the getting uh, some opulences. So Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakali Ashant. Even therefore, as they have the desire of something, you know, fruit, fruit worker, the desire for metal enjoyment, jnani is the desire for liberation and yogi desire for some metal opulences and hence they cannot be peaceful. So that's the Prabhupada uh, mentioning this in, the, in, the, in, a, uh, in this purport as well. Hence, uh, being Krishna consciousness, being in, in the devotee, uh, being in the service of Krishna, uh, we can actually be peaceful. So that's what Krishna is teaching to Arjuna that uh, these are the symptoms of the person who is situated in uh, self-realization. And let's uh, complete the two more verses where Krishna concludes saying that uh, <clears throat> a person who has given up all desires for sense gratification and who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship is devoid of all false ego, he alone can attain real peace. So false ego, understanding that I am not a doer, actually <clears throat> it's all being done by Krishna and accepting Krishna as Supreme Lord. He is, a, he is the proprietor of everything. Right. In this way, uh, a person can become, he can attain peace. Right. So, Rupa says here in this uh, purport, he says the the living entity, they cannot be desireless or senseless. I think that we've discussed many times as well. So we cannot be desireless, isn't it? However, he does have to change the quality of the desire. See, see the words of Prabhupada, you know, these are amazing. As we discussed many times earlier that we cannot, cannot be desireless desire, because without desire, a person is dead. So the living entity cannot be desireless or senseless, but he does have to change the quality of the desire. So person can desire to have sense enjoyment. At the same time, the person can have desire to serve Supreme Lord. So both has huge difference because when we, when we desire to serve Maya or when we desire to have sense enjoyment, we're actually binding ourselves. The bondage is there. We, if you do good thing, we'll get, you know, if we do pious thing, we'll get good result. If we do you know, bad thing, we'll get bad results. At the same time, when we desire to serve Krishna, there is no bondage and we are actually in the condition of blissful. Right. And hence, uh, Prabhupada continues saying that, so what he says, the living entity cannot be desireless or senseless. We need to change the desire, quality of desire. And then Prabhupada continues, says that, a materially desireless person certainly knows that everything belongs to Krishna. So anyone 
materially desireless. So anyone having no desire for material things, he knows very well that everything belongs to Krishna. Ishwaram, uh, Ishavasam idam sarvam, Prabhupada quotes from uh, Ishopanishad. And uh, therefore, he does not falsely claim proprietorship of over anything. He understands that everything is actually belongs to Krishna. And this translated knowledge is based on self-realization. And namely, knowing perfectly well that everything, every living entity is an eternal parts and partial of Krishna in a spiritual identity. And that eternal position of living entity is therefore never on the level of Krishna or greater than him. So this understanding of Krishna consciousness is the basic principle of real peace. What is that? To understand that Krishna is the proprietor of everything. So we'll discuss this point again when it comes to chapter 5, is 5.29, where Krishna Prabhupada explains about uh, peace formula and he gives a very long purport uh, so that it makes us more clear that what real peace means. And the last verse of this chapter, uh, where Krishna says that that is the way of a spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered, because he is already understand everything well. And if one is thus situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God. So I think the last same verse being always speak on already in, uh, in chapter number eight as well, Krishna speaks the same thing that uh, by situating ourselves in the last hour of death, we can actually go back to Godhead. So even Prabhupada mentioned that one can attain Krishna consciousness or life a divine life at once within a second or contradictory purposes or one may not attain such a state of life even after millions of births. So it is only a matter of understanding and accepting the fact. And Prabhupada gives the example of Katwangi Maharaj. Katwangi Maharaj, he attained uh, this life in just a few minutes. That's in one murata, that's 40 minutes of one murata and by surrendering to Krishna, right? So again, Prabhupada gives a long purport in this as well. So basically the problem, the thing is that we need to understand that uh, in the last couple of verses, Krishna trying to make understand us that understanding that Krishna is the proprietor of everything and uh, the, uh, we need to accept Krishna as it is and uh, to get that we need to take shelter of his holy name, we need to chant the holy name, we need to uh, read about Krishna, we need to hear about Krishna, we need to chant about Krishna. And hence, we can actually try to be on this platform of, of Sita Pragya as well. We can be there gradually. Right. Anyone have any questions or thoughts or any comments? I might be able to more kind of, you know, philosophical thing, but yes, again, uh, this is going on this way. Okay, so if all good, we can stop here and we'll continue. Who is on this? Yeah. Chapter three. Okay. Grantraj Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki. Jai. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Ananta Kutvashna Vrind ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.